This is chapter 2.3 of the Americans, Confederation and the Constitution. Open your book to page 66 and follow along while I lead you through it. On page 66, you will see the main idea of this section, which is American leaders created the Constitution as a blueprint for the new government of the United States. Now, why does it matter? More than 200 years after its creation, the Constitution remains the nation's guiding document for a working government. The first government of the United States of America is detailed here. It's called the Articles of Confederation. And the weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation are described here in this box. Many of these reveal the priorities of our government, which was to give more power to the wealthy elite and not to the uh, people, the uneducated masses. What's also interesting in this section is it shows you what the first actions of our new government were. Remember the Declaration of Independence said that we all desired the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But the first thing our government does has nothing to do with life or liberty or the pursuit of happiness. It has everything to do with land. Ohio was divided up in two ways. The Land Ordinance of 1785 established a plan for surveying the land, and the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, which provided a procedure for dividing land into states. Down here you'll see a rebellion, Shays Rebellion. Shays was a farmer from Massachusetts who had fought in the American Revolution and had been promised land and money for his service to our country. Because he had been fighting at the American Revolution, he hadn't been at home planting crops and earning money from his work. He had been serving our country. After the Revolution, he did not receive additional land, and he did not receive money from the government for his service to our country. He did receive a large tax bill. He fought alongside 1,200 other farmers against high taxes that were going to seize his farm and make him homeless because he had fought for our country. Because of Shays' rebellion, many of those wealthy white landowners were very afraid that there would be more violence and that they could be overthrown as the King of England had been overthrown. So they needed to create a new government that gave the wealthy white landowners even more power to maintain control and protect their wealth and their power. This new government is the constitution that we have today. The government was divided up into two plans, the Virginia plan and the New Jersey plan. The Virginia plan called for a two-house legislature where each state's population would be represented by politicians. Larger states would have more power under the Virginia plan. Under the New Jersey plan, each state would get a single vote, meaning that small states would have the same power as large states. They compromised, and they call it the Great Compromise, where Congress was given two houses, the House of Representatives and the Senate. The House of Representatives, or lower house, had uh, representation based upon population. Large states would have more power in the House of Representatives. The Senate gave every state the same number of representatives. Two. The new government of the Constitution divided the powers of government up so that there would be two levels, a national level and state level. This page, this is page 69, you'll see uh, some of the conflicts in the Constitutional Convention. And here's an interesting one, regions, north versus south. And that's primarily the conflict over slavery. The Constitution uses what's called the Three-Fifths Compromise, which called for three-fifths of a state's slaves to be counted as part of the population. Large states like Virginia 
or Georgia had many, many slaves. And the wealthy white landowners wanted those slaves to be counted toward their power in the House of Representatives. Making the Constitution a racist document that gives more power to wealthy uh, people who oppress others. In this section, you'll see the separation of powers of our government described, and this is one of the geniuses of American democracy. The fact that we have three different parts to our government, three branches. Protections for each of these branches is called checks and balances. Each branch can check or stop the other branches from doing something they think is unconstitutional or wrong. To ratify the new government, we had a debate between two groups of people, the Federalists, who wanted more power for the federal government, and the Anti-Federalists, who wanted more power for states and individuals. James Madison, along with Alexander Hamilton and John Jay, wrote a series of essays called the Federalist Papers. These papers were printed in newspapers and pamphlets all throughout the United States. And they argued that while the new Constitution wasn't perfect, it was better than the Articles of Confederation. Now, that's the Federalists. The Anti-Federalists opposed the Constitution because it did not guarantee the rights of the people or the states. Ultimately, their arguments led to the adoption of the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights was the first ten amendments to the Constitution which established some of the most basic and sacred rights that we enjoy as Americans. The right of freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press. In this section here you'll see the vocabulary for chapter 2.3. Make sure you add that to your growing list of vocabulary for the textbook. On page 72, you'll see a very important section detailing uh, the first law ever passed by the American government, the Land Ordinance of 1785. And it describes the, the territory of Ohio and how it was divided up into neat little squares. Chapter 2.4 starts on page 74 in your textbook, The Americans. This is launching the, na the new now, The nation. first thing George Washington does, and he focuses most of his presidency on this, is the court system. The Judiciary Act of 1789 establishes the structure and system of the law courts. See on page 75 how Washington shapes the executive branch. He does this by creating a cabinet or a, a, a body of advisors to help the president operate the new government. The first Secretary of State was Thomas Jefferson. He was the chief diplomat for the United States. The first Treasury Secretary was Alexander Hamilton, and he organized the new economy. And the first Secretary of War was Henry Knox, who established the United States military. Now, as Treasury Secretary, Alexander Hamilton has an economic plan that is going to focus on uh, industry, not agriculture. Alexander Hamilton's economic plan was to tax farmers for growing corn and making it into whiskey. Whiskey was one of the biggest products that farmers could make, and it was one of the easiest products for them to transport to market. We didn't have a lot of roads that were reliable at this time in our history, so farmers would ma mash down the corn into whiskey, put the whiskey into a barrel, and float that barrel down a river to market. So Alexander Hamilton was smart enough to see that this was the biggest product he, that the federal government could tax and make money from, and the making of money would lead to more power for the federal government, and that's what Alexander Hamilton wanted. The farmers rebelled, and it was called the Whiskey Rebellion. And this is not unusual. We've seen the Shays Rebellion, and now we're seeing another rebellion over taxes on whiskey. 
When we talk about the Whiskey Rebellion, one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is, how is this rebellion any different from any other rebellion? Take, for example, the Boston Tea Party. This was a rebellion against the government over taxes on tea. In the Whiskey Rebellion, we have a similar rebellion based upon taxes on whiskey. With the Boston Tea Party, we ultimately get the American Revolution. With the Whiskey Rebellion, we don't get another revolution. Why not? After the Revolutionary War, the territory of Ohio really wasn't discussed, and our taking of that land put us into conflict with the French, who were in Ohio, and the British, who were in Ohio. We sent out our diplomats and we created Jay's Treaty with the British, which established uh, that we would move into Ohio, the British would move out of Ohio, and we would create a new border with the British, at, with Canada and the United States. On page 78, you'll read about the presidency of John Adams. His big problem as president is what to do about France. Our use of Ohio and the taking of land in Ohio violated the terms of our alliance with the French. And the French started to seize our sailors on the open seas. And we wanted to negotiate a peaceful settlement with the French. And the French demanded a huge bribe. This angered Americans who felt that as an equal nation we shouldn't have to pay bribes in order to deal with the French. And we, it leads to the XYZ affair. XYZ were the names given to the French officials who demanded the bribe. Uh, and the Americans said that we would pay millions for defense, but not one cent for tribute. Essentially, we'd rather fight than pay bribes. Criticism of Adams at home leads him to pass the Alien and Sedition Acts through the Federalist-controlled Congress, meaning essentially anyone who criticizes the president, either in writing or in words, can have their citizenship taken away, and they can be thrown out of the country. This is a radical power to give to the president, and it was a very, very controversial power. And on page 79, you will see how this power led to the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions. The Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions uh, were a, a reaction to the Alien and Sedition Acts Thomas Jefferson, an anti-federalist, and James Madison, a federalist, uh, felt that these were a misuse of political power and they didn't want to see the president uh, able to uh, throw out anyone the president didn't like. And so they asserted the principle of nullification which is the idea that states have the rights to cancel or nullify any law they don't agree with by the federal government. And down here, just to, at the end of chapter 2.4, you'll see another list of vocabulary terms. You should be adding that to your growing list of vocabulary cards or vocabulary lists. So that is it for chapter 2.4. Make sure you read the chapter now and make sure you take good notes on it.